Have you ever wondered how optic fibre actually works? How does the light travel through it instead of just escaping out of the side? And how do we use light to transfer data anyway? Hi everyone, Darren from ILN Technology. Welcome to ILN Technology's Introduction to Structured Cabling Principles and Dintec Cabling Systems. This is part two of our four part webinar series to give everyone a bit more information about the cabling industry and how Dintec products fit into it. Today I'll be continuing on from our last webinar with more detail about the subsystems of structured cabling, starting with the entrance facilities. Then I'll be talking about optic fibre, a bit of its history, how it's made, how it works, and some Dintec optic fibre products. In our last webinar we started looking at structured cabling subsystems summarised in this diagram. Number one in orange on the centre right is our entrance facilities, leading to number two in purple below it, which is our equipment rooms, which lead to our telecommunications rooms in light blue on the bottom left. The cabling used to connect these areas is called backbone cabling. And the last leg of the journey joining our telecommunications rooms to our work area components is called horizontal cabling. In this webinar we'll be looking at the first step in the line, the entrance facilities, where our services first enter the building. So what are entrance facilities? In telecommunications, the entrance facilities refers to the place in a building where all of the public and private cabling comes in. In a large building, that'll usually mean a room in a basement somewhere. In a small building, it could be just an enclosure on the outside wall. Put simply, entrance facilities are where the building interfaces with the outside world. They consist of various types of telecommunications cables, including private optic fibre cables and public telephone carrier networks, where they enter a building before continuing on to the equipment rooms, which is where we'll find our servers, routers and PABX systems and so on. Entrance facilities provide connections to the external network provider. A termination point for campus and or building backbone cabling. A transition point from external to internal cables. And they can even sometimes house network computer and telecommunications equipment in some situations. There's several technical and oh &S requirements for entrance facilities. For one, they should be located close to the building entrance point. There's a number of reasons for this. If the leading cable outside ever needs to be replaced or upgraded, you don't want to be trying to run cable through cavities that only existed while the building was being constructed. We also need to consider conduits and tunnels, both phone carrier and private, when below ground can and do get gases in them, including car exhaust fumes. You don't want that stuff gathering or venting somewhere in the middle of the building. They should have adequate lighting. Workers do need to go in there from time to time and they shouldn't have to stumble around in the dark. The ceiling should be standard height so the majority of people can stand up in them. There's nothing worse than trying to work bent over or continually smacking your head on low beams. The entryways should be of adequate size to accommodate equipment. This is more something to be considered at the design stage though. There should always be consultation with the phone carrier and whoever's going to be installing the backbone cabling to make sure we know what needs to fit in there and how we future-proof ourselves as much as possible. For example, throwing an extra conduit with a drawstring in it while we've still got an open trench to work with and before the walls get plastered up and painted and so on. Electrical services should not cause any interference. The last things we need are buzzing phone lines or unreliable or slow data links. There should be a dual power outlet in an accessible location. This is more for the techies who have to work in there rather than the functionality of the room itself though. It's fairly rare to have equipment that needs power in an equipment room. And the room should be clean, dry and dust free and protected against the ingress of water. Water, dirt and electronics aren't a fantastic combination for a reliable or safe comms network. All environmental conditions should be taken into account. Stuff like gas or exhaust fumes getting in, heat and adequate ventilation and that sort of thing. Here's some typical equipment you might expect to find in an entrance facility. We've got cabinets and enclosures, our crone blocks and mounting brackets, and optic fibre equipment. This is what the entrance facility looks like in a large commercial building. You can see here all of the carrier's red and white jumper wires connecting the building's telephone system into the carrier's network. Here we'd also find optic fibre links to other buildings in a campus situation. And this is what the home version of entrance facilities usually looks like. This one here obviously could have been installed a little higher or to the left. Uh, note that gap between the conduit and the bottom of the enclosure. That might look untidy, it's done quite deliberately to prevent any gases or water in the underground network from entering the customer premises. In the case of water, it's particularly important when the building is below street level. 
I've seen these turn into fountains during downpours. In my house, this then connects to my version of an equipment room, which is a mini rack under the internal staircase. In most homes though, this will just connect to the first telephone outlet or the NBN connection box or device if you're lucky enough to have FTTP or FTTC NBN. The first phone or NBN outlet in a home is where the carrier's responsibility would normally end. Anything beyond that is your private property, which a carrier will work on if requested, but they will charge extra. In many cases a lot extra, so it may be worthwhile shopping around and get your own contractor in. Okay, that's enough about entrance facilities. Let's have a look at optic fiber. So what is optic fiber? In simple terms, instead of sending data down metal cables electronically, we're converting the data into light pulses and sending it down hair thin glass fibers, or in some cases plastic fibers. In metal cables, we basically use pulses of electricity to get our ones and zeros in our bits. With optic fiber, we use pulses of light. It's not exactly a new technology. Various experiments were made with light and glass rods way back in the late 1800s. Although modern optic fiber really began in 1967 when Corning in the UK started making high loss fiber. By 1970, Corning had developed single mode fiber with losses of around 17 dB per kilometer by using a titanium doping construction method. Titanium doping is basically using titanium dioxide, which has unique photocatalytic properties to create a chemical change in the fiber. Around that time, the first room temperature continuous wave semiconductor lasers were made. Bell Labs, University of Southampton and the Australian CSIRO had a hand in there around that time as well. And Dorset Police installed the first non-experimental optic fibre link in 1975. By 1980, fibre networks connected major cities around the world. By the mid-80s, fibre was replacing all of the telco, copper, microwave and satellite links. Then in the 90s, cable TV companies started using it to enhance the reliability of their networks, which was a major problem for them back then. Optic fibre has several advantages over traditional communication lines. They have a much greater bandwidth than metal cables, which means they can carry more data and in a much smaller cable. They're less susceptible than metal cables to interference. Because they're made from glass, they don't suffer from induced electromagnetic fields. Fiber optic cables are much thinner and lighter than metal wires, making them a logical choice for aircraft and situations where weight and space are critical factors. And data can be transmitted digitally, the natural form for computer data, rather than analogically. How is optic fiber made? Let's start with what it looks like inside. Optic fiber for telecommunications consists of three components, the core in the center, surrounded by the cladding, and then a coating. Outside of that, we have a strength member and an outer jacket to help protect the fiber. But other than that, the strength member and outer jacket play no role in how the fiber actually works. It's the core and cladding where all the magic happens. The core is the central region of an optical fiber through which light is transmitted. Core sizes range in general from 9 micron to 62.5 micron. The cladding is a glass sheath that surrounds the core. The cladding acts like a mirror, reflecting light back into the core, which I'll come back to shortly. The cladding diameter is generally 125 micron, irrespective of the size of the core diameter. A micron is 1 1 millionth of a meter, and 125 micron is slightly thicker than a typical human hair. The core and cladding are made as one piece during the manufacturing process. The outer protective coating is typically an ultraviolet light cured acrylate applied during the manufacturing process. It protects the fibre from moisture, dust and damage. It's the coating that we strip off when we fit a connector, not the cladding. So how is fibre made? You might be surprised to learn that fibre doesn't start out as a solid rod, but as a glass tube around 30 millimetres in diameter called a preform, which is heated and stretched until it becomes a hair thin solid fibre. During the process, the preform tube is injected with germanium and silicon dioxide, which will eventually fuse together to become the glass fibre core, while the original outer part of the preform tube becomes the cladding. Immediately after the glass is cooled sufficiently, the primary coating is added so that it can be stored on a drum without damage. To enable the glass to be used industrially, it has a further protective layer added, or several layers. The choice of the material for the outer layer, called the jacket, depends on the use to which the cable is to be put. For example, for aerial cables suitable for stringing up on poles, it would have a catenary wire bonded to the cable jacket to support it. I'll include a link in the description below to a video from Discovery Channel showing how fibre is made. 
So how does it work? How do we send light down a strand of glass in a controlled manner without it escaping or reflecting all over the place like a microscopic disco ball, or even stopping completely when it hits a bend? You've probably seen what happens if you stick a torch down a hose. When the light comes to a bend, it stops. So why doesn't fibre behave the same way? It's all about refraction and reflection. You've probably noticed how objects seem to bend as they enter water on an angle. This is called refraction. The effect occurs because light waves going from a dense medium to a less dense medium speed up at the boundary. This causes light rays to bend when they pass from water to air at an angle other than 90 degrees. So if we stood that pencil up directly perpendicular to the water surface and looked directly at it, we wouldn't see any refraction at all. We get the same effect if we stick a light source like a laser pointer under the water and point it upwards. At zero degrees or straight up we're getting no refraction at all and all of the light passes undisturbed straight up into the air. But as we tilt the light it starts to refract as it breaks the water surface and we get increasing angles of refraction as we increase that angle. However at a certain point called the critical angle all the waves reflect off the bottom of the water surface and back down into the water. At this point we say that the light is totally internally reflected. Here's a little experiment you can do at home to show this effect. All you need is a laser pointer and a fish tank with some water and a splash of Dettol or milk in it to make the water cloudy. Starting out with the laser pointing straight up we get no refraction or reflection at all. As we tilt it we start to get some refraction which you can see where the light is hitting the ceiling at the top of the screen. Until we reach the critical angle where the light reflects off the surface and back down into the water and also off the bottom of the tank. As we play with that angle we get lots of pretty zigzags until we get back past the critical angle again where it starts refracting back out of the water surface. So there we have it, total internal reflection. Optic fibre takes advantage of the same effect, except by using different densities of glass instead of air and water. The cladding acts as the less dense medium to reflect the light back into the core, so the light is continually guided down the core of the fibre, even when the cable bends. However, if we bend the cable too far, which is called macro bending, we'll drop back below our critical angle, lose our total internal reflection, and start getting refraction out through the cladding. That equals data loss. Here's a short video by Paul Hart from Dintech showing what macro bending looks like. All right, so I'm pushing light through this fiber, right? What happens if I bend this fiber, do you think? Okay. And the more I bend it, the more light I get coming out through it. Now this is called macro bending. And with macro bending, what's happening is we're actually changing the angle of the light as it travels through that fiber. Now remember when light for the light to stay totally internally internally reflected, it has to be within that critical angle. If we start bending the fiber as the light comes round that corner, some of that light's going to suddenly move outside that critical angle. You can see what happens here. Suddenly it fires out because angles, it angle changes such that it can no longer come back inside that fiber. Right? So that's what's happening with this macro bending of the fiber. On to fiber optic types. Multi-mode and single-mode fibre are the two types of fibre in common use today. Both fibres are 125 micron in outside diameter, but have different size cores. Multi-mode fibre has a core size of either 50 or 62.5 micron. 50 micron is often referred to as laser-rated fibre for its higher bandwidth capacity, and is called OM2, OM3 and OM4. 62.5 micron is classified as OM1, and single mode has a tiny, tiny 9 micron core diameter. Plastic optical fibre, POF, is a large core, about 1 millimetre fibre, that can only be used for short, low speed networks. Multi mode fibre has light travelling in the core in many rays called modes, hence multi mode. 
It has a bigger core than single mode and is used with LED and laser light sources with shorter light wavelengths of between 850 and 1300 nanometers for slower local area networks. So it's not always lasers with optic fiber, LEDs are used as well. Multimode optical fiber is mostly used for communication over shorter distances, such as within a building or on a campus. Typical multimode links have data rates of anything from 10 megabits a second up to 10 gigabits a second over link lengths of up to 600 meters, which is more than sufficient for the majority of premises applications. Single mode fiber on the other hand has a much smaller core, only 9 micron, and the light travels in only one ray. It's used for telephony and CATV with laser sources with longer light wavelengths of between 1310 and 1550 nanometers. Because single mode fibers don't have to deal with multiple light waves, they don't suffer from dispersion issues to the same extent as multimode. They're also better at retaining the fidelity of each light pulse over long distances. For these reasons, single mode fibers can have a higher bandwidth and a much longer range than multimode fibers. At some point we're going to need to transfer the data from fibre back to Ethernet, that is from light back to electronic, or vice versa, or perhaps even switch between single and multi-mode. That's where transceivers and transceiver modules come into play. They're essentially the same thing, a transceiver is a standalone transmit-receive device, hence transceiver, while a transceiver module plugs into a switch. There's plenty of different types depending on the distance required, whether single or multi-mode, and the type of connector needed, for example LC or SC. And modules have two different kinds of form factors to suit different switches, SFP and GBIC. SFP is small form factor pluggable, GBIC is gigabit interface converter. SFP modules are smaller than GBIC, so you can fit more horizontally in a switch or a module chassis, but other than that they perform much the same. Modules and transceivers also come in both SX and LX versions. SX, S meaning short wavelength, operate at 850 nanometers and are generally used for multi-mode fiber up to 500 meters. LX, the L meaning long, operate at long wavelength transmissions, 1270 to 1355 nanometers, over both single mode fiber up to 5 kilometers or multi-mode fiber up to 550 meters. Word of warning, don't look into open optical ports on transceivers or modules or directly into a fibre unless you're 100% sure it's not live. Lasers can cause permanent eye damage and you may not necessarily see the light or feel that you're doing damage while it's happening. Same goes with laser pointers. It's beam intensity rather than brightness that can permanently damage eyes. With optic fibre lasers I've put a little MM and SM for multi-mode and single mode on this diagram to show where they fall on the spectrum. Multi-mode lasers are around 850 to 1300 nanometers, while single mode are up around 1310 to 1550 nanometers. The visible spectrum falls between 380 and 750 nanometers. While we can see a little either side of that under the right conditions, the danger with infrared laser lights, particularly the longer wavelength lasers used in single mode, is that the light they emit is invisible to our eyes. That also means it won't trigger a blink response, so there's a risk we could be staring into a fiber without realizing that it's live. With that being said, in the vast majority of cases the risk is minimal. The light either won't be powerful enough or it scatters too quickly once it leaves the end of the fiber to do any real damage. There are exceptions though, so it's better to play it safe in all cases and not look directly at them. And now some Dintec optic fiber products. Dintec offers a complete range of optic fiber products including cables, connectors, enclosures, adapters and couplers, patch cords, cassette patch panels, and toolkits including the Easy Fiber Connect system which uses mechanical connectors rather than epoxy types, so terminations, splices or repairs can be done much easier and faster. Here's some examples of some different pigtails and patch leads available, including fan-out cable assemblies for multi-fiber connections. And there's plenty of different connectors. There's probably about a hundred different connector types on the market, but you'll come across LC and SC more often these days. Connectors can basically be categorized by the pin and surface area, and whether they're single or multi-mode. You might also notice that some of the connectors here are doubles and some are singles. These are referred to as simplex or duplex. A duplex connector is used where a separate transmit and receive are required, while a simplex transmit and receives over the same fiber. The first one at the top left is LC, which stands for Lucid Connector. 
It uses a 1.25mm ceramic ferrule and has a similar shape but half the size of the SC on the bottom line. SC stands for subscriber connector, sometimes called square or standard connector. MTRJ, mechanical transfer registered jack, is another one we might come across from time to time. It's a duplex connector with both fibres in a single polymer ferrule. It uses pins for alignment and has male and female versions. It's multi-mode only, field terminated only by the pre-polished splice method, which I'll show you shortly. MTP connectors are a trademark type of MPO connector, which stands for multi-fibre push-on. They come in 4, 8, 12, 24 and 72 fibre versions for multi-mode, and 4, 8, 12, 24 fibre versions for single mode. Also fairly common are ST connectors, which stands for straight tip, and FC, which stands for ferrule connector or fibre channel connector. SM and MM stand for single mode and multi mode along the bottom there. You might occasionally come across a need for an adapter or coupler to connect two cables together. Adapter panels and rack mounted enclosures are available. And of course, wall mounted enclosures. There's three different types of connection systems with corresponding toolkits available. There's mechanical connector kits, epoxy polishing connector kits, and fusion splices. This table outlines the main differences between the three connection methods. Basically, mechanical connectors are the easiest to work with and fairly cheap to get into, however, have a relatively high cost per termination. Epoxy terminations are more time consuming and fiddly, but there's no other option with some connector types. A fusion splicer is the priciest option to get into, but creates the highest quality of splice connection, and is the more economical option if you're doing lots and lots of splicing, like an NBN techie. The Easy Fibre Connect System Quick Install Technician's Kit includes everything needed to quickly and easily fit off our Easy Fibre Single and Multi-Mode Quick Connectors and Mechanical Splices, eliminating most of the steps and labour associated with traditional epoxy fibre optic terminations. The kit includes the Easy Fibre Cleaving Tool, Fibre Strippers, Kevlar Scissors, a Fibre Checker, Alcohol Bottle and Wiper, 10 Mechanical Splices and Easy Fibre SC Connectors and more. In our previous webinar, we saw a short video of the Easy Fiber Connect system in action. If you'd like to see it again, I'll include a link to webinar 1 in the description below, or you can check out the full video at Dintech Taiwan's YouTube channel, which I'll link to below as well. The Dintech Professional Epoxy Termination Kit contains everything you need to complete epoxy terminations, including an inspection microscope so you can inspect the accuracy of your work, fiber stripper, Kevlar scissors, fiber connector crimp tool, fibre scribing tool, epoxy, empty syringes for epoxy dispensing, a glass polish plate, a rubber polish pad, lapping films, several grits are included, and polishing pucks. Here's a two minute video showing an epoxy termination. I cut heaps out of this one and then played it at double speed to get it down to a couple of minutes for this webinar. The process normally takes over 10 minutes, but hopefully this will give you the gist of it. If you want more detail, you can check out the original video on Dintech Taiwan's YouTube channel, which I'll link to below. Dintech Epoxy Fiber Connector Demo. First, get all the parts of your connector organized. Cut off the dodgy connector, then strip off about 50 millimeters of the outer jacket. Leave about 10 millimeters of the Kevlar strength member. We'll need that later. Then strip off the exposed outer coating about 10 millimeters at a time. Give it a good clean with an alcohol wipe. Then it's epoxy time. Mix up equal parts of the epoxy into the syringe. Inject it into the connector and pull the syringe out slowly. Be careful inserting the fibre into the connector. Take it nice and easy. Push the metal band up. And crimp it on. Then fit the boot. Allow a few minutes for the epoxy to harden and then carefully cleave off the excess fibre.
Then we start the polishing process using increasing levels of fineness in our polishing pads. The next two stages involve inserting the connector into a supplied puck and then a figure eight motion of polishing. Polishing, 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 polishing. And then the final stage with the finest grade polishing pad. Polishing, 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 really fast polishing. Then insert it into the magnifying glass to check it. If it's done right, you should see a nice clean black core, just like that one. Then put the cap back on. Job done. And lastly, the Fusion Splicer. A Fusion Splicer is the priciest option to get into, but creates the highest quality of splice connection, and is the more economical option if you're doing lots and lots of splicing. Fusion Splicers are fully automated machines that do most of the work. The operator uses a high quality cleaver to prepare the fibres, and then inserts them into the jaws of the splicer. The machine automatically aligns the ends, makes the splice using an electric arc like an arc welder, and even gives an estimate of the loss. Fusion Splices can splice one fibre at a time, or all the fibres in a ribbon. I'll include a link below to a video with a microscopic view of what happens inside a Fusion Splicer. And that brings us to the end of this webinar. In our next webinar we'll start looking at the next subsystems, equipment rooms and telecommunications rooms, and we'll also look at backbone cabling and associated components. For more information about Dintech products, please visit our website at www.dintech.com.au or you can send an email to sales at dintech.com.au. Don't forget to like and follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter under the Dintech Australia name. Thanks everyone and bye for now.